Well, aloha and good morning. Great to see all of you tuning in here on this April 27, 2020, as we begin yet another week together in this COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Ryan Kalesuji, along with Yanji Denise, and we are here on the platform of the Honolulu Star Advertiser Facebook page for the COVID-19 Care Conversation brought to you by the Hawaii Executive Collaborative. And great to see all of you. Yanji, great to see you another week. <laughs> yes, indeed, another week. And it looks like we are facing many more weeks. The governor announcing on Saturday that the stay-at-home order following uh, Honolulu Mayor Kirk Caldwell's similar announcement just a few days before that, the statewide stay-at-home order being extended until May 31st. We are so fortunate to have Governor Ige on with us this morning. He's going to be answering your questions about the extension and about some of the uh, businesses that might be able to open a little bit early, along with when we can see some things lifted and how long this new way of life is here to stay. Also, a little bit later this morning, we have two guests today, uh, Gwen Yamamoto Lau from DBED is joining us here. She's going to be talking about the Paycheck Protection Program. If you or someone you know is a small business owner, there is still time for them to join this live stream. So please have them join us. We're going to be taking lots of questions about the PPP and try to figure out how best to uh, direct Hawaii business owners so they can get some of that federal money. That's right. The second wave of the PPP uh, going out. And I know a lot of local businesses hoping to get included on that second round. We'll hear more from her as well as from the governor. So we encourage you to share this video, uh, add in your questions as we sort of begin this conversation. Of course, we'd like to always begin by providing an update with the latest numbers that were released on Sunday. The state announcing two new cases for a total of 606 positive cases. Uh, an Oahu man also was reported uh, that passed away last night, bringing the total to 15 deaths. That's three new deaths since Friday. Uh, the good news is of the 606 cases, 488 patients in Hawaii have recovered since the start of the outbreak, uh, as well as the new cases have remained in those single digits and 14 uh, days have passed since Kauai has seen uh, a new case. So we're seeing that island stable as we talked to Mayor Kawakami last week about their efforts as well. So uh, unfortunately another death, but continuing to see those numbers go down, which is what state officials want to see. Yeah, Hawaii now can boast that we have the lowest infection rate in the country, um, which is an amazing distinction, and we are so happy to see that. So, you know, as tough as this is, officials keep reminding us that this is working, uh, that the stay-at-home order, the wearing masks, the social distancing, it all has a purpose, and we are seeing the fruits of that now with just two new cases reported on Sunday. That is an amazing uh, milestone to have reached, and we hope we continue to see those single digits. That's right. So we have the governor coming up. Uh, we're going to talk to him more about the extension order that was placed uh, for, in effect for the counties, uh, uh, excuse me, for the entire state. Uh, but we actually want to bring the governor in now to talk a little bit more about that order and the announcement that was made. Governor, good morning. Great to see you. We want to start off by talking about uh, your extension of the stay at home order that you made over the weekend. And also in that order, uh, you sort of talked about the um, having the counties sort of report to the state for a, you know, to kind of check in with the state before making some of their own orders. If you can talk more about this latest uh, declaration and proclamation that you, you made on Saturday. Certainly, thank you uh, so much again for giving me this opportunity to uh, speak with your uh, followers and um, uh, those who are uh, following the COVID-19 activities on the Star Advertiser. Uh, I did uh, this weekend extend um, my sixth emergency proclamation uh, to for this COVID pandemic. And it, it does uh, two uh, very specific uh, things. First is that I'm hearing an echo. Are you guys hearing it or can you hear me no, fine? You're fine for hear, us. Okay. Hopefully that's not too distracting for okay. you because I know that that can be pretty troublesome. Yeah, no. So I, I just want to make sure it's not um, it's not coming through to your um, followers. Um, uh, so it does two things. First, it does extend the 14 day mandatory quarantine on all incoming travelers. So uh, that's air or um, ocean travelers coming to the state will still be required to uh, to do the 14 day self um, quarantine. Uh, residents returning again would be uh, self quarantining at home. Uh, and as you are aware, we have implemented um, more stricter follow-up on the, the quarantine orders, uh, working with hotels uh, and others, verifying that uh, we get a, a telephone number that is valid um, at the point of entry, 
uh, making sure that they do have for travelers, uh, they do have a confirmed uh, reservation uh, in the quarantine site. So we do believe that that'll uh, help to um, improve uh, compliance with the man uh, mandatory quarantine order. Uh, we also did extend or I did extend the stay at home order and uh, you know, it is something that will be with us for a long time. But uh, if you look at the stay at home order, what it does say is that uh, essential businesses conducting essential operations can continue and that uh, remains uh, the same. Uh, it does uh, order people to stay at home except to go to essential businesses and to conduct essential activities. So as we move forward into the month of May, We'll, we will be looking at what the conditions are uh, in our community and making decisions about relaxing some of those restrictions in very focused and targeted ways. So, you know, I would probably refer to this next phase sort of as, um, and I've, I've heard it used in other jurisdictions, a safer at home, that you would be safer at home, but we're going to allow uh, more activities uh, some of the activities that are not explicitly essential, but is so important for us to get back to normal activities here in our community. You know, one of the activities that a lot of people had a question about, and that was on the front page of the paper today, was this idea of flower delivery on Mother's Day. Um, a lot of people want to show mom a little bit of love this Mother's Day. Uh, what happened there and when will you make a decision to finalize whether or not folks are allowed to actually do flower delivery? You know, certainly uh, that activity um, was approved uh, by uh, people who really didn't have the authority to do that. So uh, we uh, have notified the, the florist that had applied uh, and we will be looking at um, whether uh, we want to allow that activity uh, statewide. Uh, one other portion uh, of my uh, emergency proclamation, as Ryan had talked about, does require coordination between state and county actions. And, you know, we had included that provision because we heard uh, from the public that it was uh, confusing at times to get uh, orders from the state that varied from counties. Uh, you know, we recognize that every county is different. As you said now, uh, Kauai has not had any new cases for two weeks. Um, so we acknowledge that there might be different policies uh, in different counties, but we want to be as consistent as possible so that um, the public is not confused. Uh, so we are looking at the whole issue of florists and whether florists should be uh, allowed to operate. Um, you know, we uh, for all of the non-essential businesses, uh, we do a, a, an assessment of risk, uh, looking at, um, you know, risk is measured in three dimensions. Uh, the first is um, the intensity of the contact. So can the business be conducted without face-to-face -face, uh, contact between customers and employees, which increases the risk? Uh, the second dimension is really the number of contacts. So how busy is a florist? Um, can they implement social distancing um, uh, operations to minimize the interaction and contact? Uh, the third dimension really is, can they implement changes to what they normally do to uh, reduce risk to both employees and customers? Uh, so, you know, we will be going to all of the non-essential businesses and asking those kinds of questions uh, and trying to make decisions about which non-essential activities should be reopened. So, so Yanji, I don't have a specific date at this point in time. Uh, we do meet, uh, I do talk with the mayors uh, three times a week, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and we will be discussing these specific issues and making decisions, um, you know, virtually as, uh, as we make them. You know, one of the things that we also saw this weekend was the reopening here in the city and county of Honolulu of uh, parks as well as beaches that were also included in the order that people can now exercise on the beach. Uh, but with that, we saw a lot of people again going out, which was great to see people being able to go to the parks, but some people still violating those orders, gathering in groups, lounging on the beaches. Uh, is there a point maybe where the state, state might consider rescinding that and, and closing it once again if those crowds get too large again? 
Yeah, so Ryan, I think it's a combination of a couple of things. And you guys started by saying, definitely we see the number of cases going down, you know, and we've been in single digits now for a, a couple of days, uh, probably almost a week now. Um, and so that's a good trend. Um, but we've also seen uh, the, the number of mortalities increase, you know, and certainly that's the part that would be concerning to us. And we're really uh, trying to drill down and try and understand why, why that's happening. Uh, but so uh, first and foremost, it's about what the health condition of our community. Uh, and we do see the trends in the right direction. And we've been this way for um, you know, last week was the first week I think we had uh, single digits through the whole week. So we do monitor that. The second condition is really about testing. And do we have adequate testing in our community? Um, both private labs have a step to the challenge and now are staying locally. So, you know, the national guideline uh, is about 30 tests per thousand people that we have available. And we are uh, exceeding that threshold. We now have the capability to test in the state uh, about 3,000 individuals per day if we needed to. Uh, and so we definitely have now the testing capacity that we need. Uh, so, uh, and then the third point is really about our healthcare, the status of our healthcare system. What's the utilization of the hospitals? ICU units, uh, ventilators, uh, can we accommodate the number of uh, sick individuals? And I think we've seen the nightmare that has occurred in New York and Michigan and some of those other communities where the number of sick have just far exceeded the capacity of the system. Uh, so in that regard, again, we're in good shape. So, you know, one of the components of my um, executive order last week is to relax the restrictions on medical procedures. So we're allowing the medical community, uh, because we see the utilization within what the target would be, to begin to allow elective procedures. Uh, you know, we're asking them to prioritize, look for those procedures that don't take the same resources that COVID-19 patient would, uh, and begin to uh, restart um, uh, medical procedures that are so essential to our community. So, you know, those are the things that we would be looking at. Let's talk a little bit about inner island movements. Um, you know, I know that there are, are very strict, uh, con very important considerations when we think about people coming from uh, the continent. But when we look at inner island travel, do you expect, when do you expect that to reopen? Are we waiting all the way until the 31st before people can go from island to island? Or do you expect that to happen before then? Yanji, I can tell you this, that we would, uh, definitely be looking at the inter-island quarantine as kind of a separate issue from the quarantine on all incoming from international as well as the, the U.S. and other, uh, other locations. Um, we uh, would be considering um, dropping the inter-island quarantine uh, at, on a separate timetable and probably ahead of what we do with um, uh, inbound from uh, elsewhere around the world. Uh, part of that is really the conversations with the mayors and, uh, you know, obviously all of them are trying to keep their community safe uh, from the virus. Uh, and we see uh, various conditions, you know, like you said, Kauai has had actually two weeks with no new cases. You know, Hawaii Island, for example, if you subtract out the cluster associated with McDonald's in Kona, uh, would have very little cases. Uh, and similarly on um, on Maui County, uh, Lanai has not had any cases. Um, Molokai had a, a couple, uh, but the large majority of the cases recently were tied to uh, Maui um, Memorial Medical Center. So, uh, you know, we are working with all of them and trying to decide uh, what would be appropriate in terms of inter-island travel. You know, one of the concepts we've uh, talked about is, um, you know, it's akin to a soft opening on a business, right? We want to encourage activities and see what the impact is on the number of cases. Uh, so we will be looking at non-essential businesses first, 
we will begin the conversations about inter-island travel and whether we can allow it um, and not see a spike in cases. I mean, I think that that would be uh, critical. You know, in talking about the um, the visitor arrivals and, and people coming into the state last week, we've heard from that Senate discussion about uh, several different options that the Attorney General had spoken about that the state is looking into, possible bracelets uh, that uh, visitors would have to wear, a, a number of different ideas to sort of gauge and track these four people on the 14-day quarantine. Has there been, and, and we know that the state, as you mentioned, is gonna be taking stricter uh, measures moving forward, but is there anything that was mentioned on Friday in terms of other alternative ways to track guests? Was there anything that you're sort of in favor, favor of or looking or leaning more towards? You know, I think we all want to be able to do a better job of quarantine in general. So, you know, there's a couple of things I think that are more realistic and pragmatic. I mean, obviously, Ryan and, and Yanji, you guys know, uh, hospitality is the heartbeat of our economy. Uh, and if it becomes so restrictive that people don't want to come here, uh, you, we see what happens. You know, we have uh, more than 250,000 people who are unemployed. So uh, I think we need to be thoughtful. I do think that um, the low hanging fruit, if you would, is really looking at facilities for quarantine and isolation. Oh, and that might be where we have to leave it with the governor. Hopefully his feed catches up, but I'm not sure. Certify oh, and identify go. specific uh, areas that people would have to go to rather than allowing them to choose their own accommodation. So I think that that's kind of the next step. I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, we do know and we, we're also thinking about, you know, part of the reopening plan has to deal with COVID positive travelers as well as residents. And uh, we've talked about, um, you know, potentially having a site where COVID positive people can, um, you know, ride out their uh, uh, infection in a way that doesn't endanger other people. Um, you know, the, the very sick ones will be in hospitals, but maybe we ought to have them in an accommodation where we can provide them food and support uh, and reduce the risk to the rest of the community of being infected. We see a lot of questions here about unemployment. We just want to remind everybody that Scott Murakami is going to be on tomorrow who will answer specific questions about unemployment. So we just want to remind you of that. Um, some questions here about graduation and schools. We know that graduation is, is canceled. Uh, what do you think the fall is going to look like? I, I know when we had Dr. Kishimoto on, she said that she was proceeding with plans for summer school. Do you anticipate summer school and looking ahead, do you think fall will be uh, business as usual when it comes to education? Well, I mean, I think that that's uh, the challenge, uh, Yunji. Um, the world will be different going forward. And this is the new normal. Um, you know, we are going to have to live with an infectious disease probably for the next 12, 18 months at minimum until a vaccine is developed and, and widely distributed. So, uh, you know, I think that that's the discussion at the national level. What do we do with school? Uh, we do know that um, children are not impacted by the virus. Uh, we have more information that say that they might be uh, carriers of the virus and might be infecting others but um, the symptoms that they've experienced are very much milder than uh, others in our community. So, um, and we know how important public schools are in our community. You know, I have three children. If, um, if they weren't in school, you know, I would have to have childcare and a whole number of other things. So, um, you know, public school, when we look at all of these activities, all of these uh, organizations, all of these businesses, you know, we're trying to weigh the value that the, the entity has to our community, you know, against the, the risk that would be involved with uh, an infected person being on that in that situation and infecting others. And, you know, and the public school is the real challenge because we all see the high value that public school has to our community. Uh, and it's a lot of children. So there's a there can be a risk of infection if we don't do it right. We're also seeing questions coming in right now about the PPP uh, process. And we have 
uh, Gwen Yamamoto-La, who's standing by, actually, she's logged in. So we're just going to uh, get a few more questions in with the governor before going over to her. In, in talking sort of about these small businesses, one of the things that we're hearing directly from small business uh, is that they're saying that the landlords have given them, you know, sort of these three months deferred rent, but some of these landlords are now expecting payment on the fourth month rent, uh, fourth month's rent, along with three months of the deferred payment uh, all at once, which is going to be difficult for those small businesses to do. Is there anything that the state can do to sort of help these businesses out to maybe defer payments, or, or what can be done to kind of make sure that these small businesses sort of are able to stay in business? Well, so a couple of things, Ryan, and clearly Gwen is the right person to talk to because Paycheck Protection Program is like the number one thing. They really should uh, sign up because it does allow them to help keep their people employed as well as pay rent. So that is one option. You know, we also received CARES Act funds and we are looking at what is the biggest need for where we place that fund. Um, so... Uh, we are intended to identify gaps in, in support and then use the funds that we get to close those gaps. You know, one real key gap, I guess, for most businesses is unemployment insurance. You know, we know that unemployment is through the roof. Normally, it's a trust fund and the businesses pay for insurance premiums that provides unemployment benefits. Obviously, with the number of uh, unemployed, uh, the uh, UI tax would go through the roof for all businesses and all businesses would bear that cost. So we are looking at CARES Act money to support unemployment so that the insurance rates for businesses don't go through the roof. So that's just, you know, it, it is a complex situation. We're looking at all the different things and ways that state can provide support. You know, I would encourage people to go after that support that we know about and help us identify the gaps because we're gonna try and shape programs to fill the gaps. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Governor. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time again. Um, any final thoughts maybe that you have? Again, we're continuing to see these numbers go down, which is great, but it could maybe give a false message to people that were in the clear. What, what would your message uh, to people be right now? You know, as I said, I think we are going to have to live with COVID-19 at least for the next 12 months. So, you know, obviously we're we're creating a system that we can ratchet up and ratchet down the restrictions that we have to live with. I, I would just want to let people know that they are safer at home, you know, that they need to uh, implement um, hygiene, wash your hands, uh, use hand sanitizer, uh, clean your surfaces at home that are high touch. You know, all of those things has to become part of our daily lives. And then, you know, thank you for the support. The reduction in numbers is really a community success about everyone taking responsibility, uh, limiting their exposure to infection and exposure of others. So I just really want to thank everyone for everything they've done, all that they've sacrificed to this point, and just let them know that we can only be successful if we work together. And I, and I, you can count on me and state government to be an active partner in that partnership. All right, Governor Ige, thank you so much again for starting off the week with us and we'll see you again uh, next week. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Yanji. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you right. so much. Okay, interesting to have the governor join us there. And if you missed uh, the top of the program, just to bring you up to speed, we have two guests today. So Gwen Yamamoto Lau from DBED is joining us to talk about the payment protection um, uh, program that got some new money today. Also wanting to let folks know that uh, the stay at home order is in effect until May 31st. And we will talk about that in just a minute, but we have Gwen joining us now. So Gwen, we wanna get right to you. So good morning. Um, good morning. And uh, if you are a small business owner or if you know someone who is, invite them to join the program now because this is a real rare opportunity to get some insight. This program is so big and complex and the money last time ran out, boom, like that. So how can Hawaii businesses best position themselves to get some of this new funding? Yeah, so the... Uh as you said, the first funding of 349 billion ran out in 14 short days. Um, 310 billion additional funding was approved by Congress. The SBA opened their portal up, 
this morning at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I am aware that the local lenders here reported to work at 4.30 this morning to start loading up those applications again. It's first come, first serve. Um, I will say that in the first round, Hawaii was successful in getting over 11,000 small businesses uh, loans uh, with the PPP program, but we had over 22,000 apply. So we had just as many happy small businesses as we did unhappy small businesses because they did not get the funding. The, the lenders are putting these applications through again. They have to resubmit it through ETRAN again, and they're, that's what they're doing right now. Okay, um, for, great. So, sorry, go ahead, Ryan. So for those businesses that um, maybe did not get approved, uh, they're just assuming that their applications are sort of in the queue and that the lenders will sort of resubmit them again. Right. So what the what the lenders were doing between the time that the funding ran out until this morning was um, prepping it to make sure that it is ready to go. One of the things that um, I am uh, thrilled about is in this round, um, a lot of the lenders have uh, automated their e-trans submission through the SBA portal. So I'm hopeful that more uh, loans are able to go through. Literally, the lenders were working uh, nonstop from you know 2.30 a.m. April 3rd in shifts because it was a manual process to uh, input through eTran, but I'm hopeful that with the automation that more applications will go through more timely. One of the things though I, I do caution is we received word yesterday that the SBA is allowing um, banks, and these are primarily large banks because it, uh, they're gonna allow bulk filing this morning uh, with a minimum 15,000 applications in the queue. So none of our local lenders have 15,000. We're not able to participate in that bulk filing, but that means that the funds will go even faster because of the bulk filings being allowed uh, with lo lenders that have 15,000 or more applications in the queue. That is pretty discouraging to think about, especially because those banks will take such a big chunk of that money. Um, to the, to the people who were rejected the last time, if you were rejected last time, obviously you should speak to your lender, um, but what is the biggest reason for the rejections? Is it just simply that they ran out of money? Yeah, so there's two two things. One, some might have been deemed ineligible. There's affiliation rules. There's certain um, uh, nonprofits that are not eligible. Uh, social nonprofits like country clubs are not eligible. Um, so they might have been declined by the lender because they're not eligible under the program. The others who did not get an approval is simply because time ran out, money ran out before the applications were, were processed. A couple of things that Congress has done with this uh, this appropriation based on the feedback received from the first one is they have put in some guidelines um, to ensure that more smaller businesses and minority owned businesses, women owned businesses and veteran owned businesses um, are able to access the funds. So they carved out uh, $60 billion for smaller financial institutions, credit unions and CDFIs to, to process. One of the questions that I questions wanted to bring you, in was, yeah, <laughs> was uh, Jackie asking, how does the forgiveness work for PPP and what are some of the uh, you know, qual qualifications that need to be met in order for that loan to be forgiven? Okay, so one of the things that's most important to understand is the objective of this program is a paycheck protection program. The objective is to get people who have been furloughed or employers who are contemplating furlough employees to keep them on payroll. So. Uh, the loan amount is determined by the average um, payroll cost over the last 12 months, divided by 12 to get an average, um, times two and a half. So the loan amount is determined by two, two months worth of payroll times two and a half. Uh, to get forgiveness, 75% of your loan amount needs to be used for eligible payroll costs, payroll wages, um, medical benefits, retirement benefits, if the company paid that before uh, the pandemic and 25% can be used for other things as governor had mentioned such as rent, uh, mortgage interest and utilities. If you follow that guideline um, that means that your loan will be forgivable. One of the things though that the um, lenders will be looking at in your forgiveness is they're going to look at your employee count as well as your compensation level paid from the eight weeks after you got your loan to match it to your pre-pandemic um, uh, numbers. If your employee count or your compensation levels decrease, then your forgivable amount is gonna be prorated uh, 
similarly paraded downwards. Um, one of the things though, so, you know, I, I'm gonna say additional guidance has been issued by the SBA because uh, Congress, um, you know, is wanting, they wanted to prevent windfalls that Congress did not intend. So a couple of things. One is, um, and I'm going to read this because this is really important. So applicants need to certify that current economic uncertainty makes the PPP loan request necessary to support the ongoing operations of the applicant, taking into account their current business activities and their ability to access other sources of liquidity sufficient to support their op ongoing operations. So uh, SBA realizes that maybe that was not clear or maybe applicants didn't understand that this is what they're certifying. And so they have provided a limited safe harbor that if these applicants who receive funding pay back the loan by May 7th, that that's their safe harbor. They're, they're, they'll be good with that because they realize that this uh, guidance only came out three days ago after the application was accepted. The other thing is we've been hearing that some employers are getting um, pushback from their furloughed employees that they're offering to rehire. Uh, because, um, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, some of the furloughed employees are making more on unemployment, especially with that bonus from the CARES Act, than they were being employed. I want to caution these employees because um, rejecting a job offer may invalidate your unemployment benefits. Mm -hmm. um, We've also received guidance from the SBA local office for these employers because, again, their, for, their forgiveness amount is based on the employee count. So they need to first offer their furloughed employees a job. If they reject the job, that's up to the employee. They could invalidate their uh, unemployment compensation. But the uh, SBA is saying to the employer, document that your, your employee has rejected the job, and then you can hire someone else who is... Um, not currently employed, in order to get their numbers and their compensation levels up to the level that they need to in order to get the forgiveness. That's interesting. We had a question come in here from Joe Thompson saying, should we apply through the larger banks? You know, if the larger banks, the JP Morgan Chases of the world, if they're the ones who are getting those bulk funds, um, or should you stick with the lo local lender that you've already talked to? So we are recommending that you go with a lender that you already have a relationship with. And the reason for that is because the banks and the credit union still have to go through their Bank Secrecy Act um, uh, identification of who you are. So it takes a little bit longer. So if you have a relationship with them, then by all means, go with whoever you have a relationship with first. I know that it's difficult for you to maybe answer this question, but one of the questions is for those who have received, you know, that first wave that will take them to the end of June, right? Those two and a half months. Uh, but a lot of them are saying, and then what? Because if we're sort of in the same position, uh, they could need a second injection. But, you know, there's a lot of people who haven't received anything. Uh, how do you think that they're going to be able to navigate through some of those supports and, and helping to keep these people flow past the next few months? Right, so it's hard to say, no one has a crystal ball. I will say though, um, on Saturday, uh, we uh, practicing social social distancing, we actually did a technical assistance um, to the Chinatown business owners because um, we had found that language is a barrier. So we had uh, applications uh, translated and we provided technical assistance. Uh, staff from Congressman Case's office was there and they did recognize that um, this might not be enough. There is another package being um, contemplated and worked on. And so we will, you know, they understand, they, they realize this might not be enough and they'll likely come up with something uh, at a later date based on what the needs are. Um, the last time the money went, uh, went in two weeks, you said 14 days. How fast do you expect these funds to be distributed? And gobbled up. Yeah, so because of the um, backlog of applications in queue, I think uh, analysts are expecting it to be uh, gone quicker. However, there are the carve out, carve outs. And again, uh, Congress did want to have um, minority uh, veterans and women owned businesses um, have access to these funds. So they do have a carve out for that too. Uh, and to that point, you know, again, we did DBED, uh, worked uh, with uh, local chambers, ethnic chambers this past week to get the uh, applications and document checklists uh, translated. So it's in Chinese, 
Korean, Japanese, Thai, Tagalog, and soon to be posted Vietnamese. And it's on the DBED in bestway.gov website. So if you have a language barrier and need assistance there, please go to the website to um, look for the translated documents. You still will need to submit your application via however the lender wants it, whether it's online or paper applications. If it's paper applications, you need to complete it in English, the English version, but that will help you understand what you're completing. One of the questions also we have from Jerome is, will there be a standard law to follow uh, once, you know, if they get the PPP loan to justify their spending, maybe a, a tracker, some sort of mechanism that can help them make sure that they are following the steps that needs to be taken in order to get the loan forgiven at the end? Yeah, so the, the challenge is, so we know 75% needs to be used for eligible payroll costs, 25% can be used for other costs, which are only mortgage interest, rent and utilities. Um, the lenders are going to be required, so eight weeks after you get your loan, you're going to be uh, applying to your lender that you got the loan from uh, with a forgiveness application. The challenge is uh, SBA has not come up with that application yet, so no one knows for sure. However, I will uh, encourage everyone to document what you're using loan proceeds for, clearly document it so that you can provide it to the lender um, to show them that the funds were used for only eligible purposes. And again, keep track of that 75, 25% split. So it has to be a, min, a, max, a minimum of 75 towards payroll, minimum of 25 towards other things. It doesn't mean that you cannot use more towards payroll. Got it. That's amazing to think that they've released all this money and that that next step, you know, that's not that far away, eight weeks down the line. And for that application to not even that paperwork to not even been created, it just shows you how this really is just piecemeal as we go being created. It, it is. However, you know, Congress, um, it's it's these are unique times. Right. So uh, SBA and the Treasury had 10 days from the time Congress approved the first bill to put this loan program together. And that's unheard of. Any government agency uh, uh, lending uh, $349 billion, putting together a program in 10 days. That was part of the challenges. So they put it together and they stood up the program in 10 days, but almost daily there were changes to the program, which made it harder for lenders to um, get the loans through. So, you know, and again, as, as recent as three days ago, new guidance came out. So uh, we understand it's it's tough for the lenders. It's certainly tough for the applicants, but um, it's the, the speed in which the program is being put together and has been put together. Okay, so for anyone who's watching this, who is a small business who didn't apply that last time and is now starting out, what would your advice to them be? Because I'm sure the banks are pretty busy. Yeah, so, you know, there are uh, lenders that are still accepting application. There are lenders that are trying to work through the queue before they stop, start accepting applications. Um, my recommendation to them is to complete the application, whether it's on the portal or in paper, as um, completely as possible. There's an additional document checklist on our website that the lenders, that is not information on the application that the lenders need to submit to eTrans. So please make sure you, you download that document checklist, have that um, doc information available because the quicker the lender can uh, process your application with all of the information that they need, the better for your for your application, because if they have to put it aside, uh, follow up with you and get additional information, it's just gonna delay the process. Um, with your application, you wanna submit all of the documentation that the lender needs to uh, justify the loan amount. So if you're a sole proprietor, use your Schedule C. If you are a farm use, farmer, use your Schedule F. If you have uh, uh, employees on payroll, use your 941s. Um, bring all of your documents or give all of your documentation to the banks and the lenders so that they know they can um, review your application. All right, uh, Gwen Yamamoto Law, thank you so much. We know that this is a busy day for you all, uh, everyone here uh, and we appreciate you taking the time to join us. Uh, maybe we can bring you back in a few weeks and, and hopefully there's another wave so we can, uh, you know, get an update and get and help more people. But thank you. We really appreciate you being thank here with you. us today. Thank, thank you. you. Wow, incredible to think about all that money gone so quickly. And, um, you know, I mean, good news that 11,000 Hawaii businesses got it, but to hear that it was a 50% rejection as well is not so great, hopefully in this next round. 
Uh, we see more Hawaii businesses getting that paycheck relief or uh, paycheck protection, and we will stay on that for you. We probably will have Gwen back because she's a great resource and we really appreciate her being here. Um, and, and we're actually speaking with Congressman Ed Case uh, later this week on Wednesday, so we can get more information from him as to potentially if we will see another wave and some of the other efforts that Congress is taking to help support. So uh, again, make sure you tune in on Wednesday when we will be speaking with uh, Congressman Ed Case. I saw a lot of unemployment questions peppered in there too. Remember uh, Tuesday, that is tomorrow, Scott Murakami from the Department of Labor and Industrial Relations is going to be joining us. He's going to be giving us an update on how those funds, you know, how many of those 250,000 applications they've been able to get through. Also, hopefully an update on what's going on for the self-employed, those 1099 folks, um, because we know that there are a lot of you out there and uh, we want to make sure that you get answers on that as well. That's right. And again, if you missed uh, the earlier part of our segment, we spoke to Governor Ige. So make sure you head on back to get an update to hear more about what the governor said about this new order, uh, about some of the questions that we posed about inter-island travel. All of that, again, will be posted and listed here on the Honolulu Star Advertiser. So I encourage you to go back and watch that part if you missed our conversation with the governor. Uh, we always like to bring in a Hawaii hero of the day. We like to highlight someone who's doing good in the community. We saw so many people doing so many good things over the weekend. It was actually really hard to choose today. We want to give honorable mentions, if you will, to the Aloha Harvest Challenge and also to everyone Hawaii. Uh, but these guys caught our eye. Aloha Harvest, in partnership with Chef Hui and the City of County in Honolulu, gave away a thousand bags. You see some of the many bags right there of uh, food for free to families in need. They included enough produce, protein, and ingredients to feed a family of six to eight people. And so we really loved seeing this. Um, it's just so great to see all that goodwill out there. Everyone Hawaii giving out the masks over the weekend. And then, of course, Aloha Harvest Challenge giving out those what they were calling cakey stimulus packs uh, mm -hmm. at Latour on Nimitz. Yeah, you know, it's so great to see uh, just the community coming together. But I also think it's it's very uh, real. It, it kind of puts a realistic tone to all of this when you see the amount of people that are lining up for this, that the need is definitely real, uh, that these care packages and these food items that are being handed out are going to people who really need them because these lines are, are really getting longer and longer as people find themselves struggling. So we appreciate all that people in our community, our businesses are doing to help care for our own island uh, communities. And so we encourage you, if you have a Hawaii hero that you would like to highlight, please send us a message. Uh, we're always looking for people that are doing good in our community, especially during these times. Yeah. On another note, we want to encourage you to fill out the census. That PPP money, you know, the way they figure out the funding is by counting who is where. Uh, and so stand up and be counted. 2020census.gov. If you haven't gotten something in the mail, go online and go fill something out. Uh, make sure you do it through the census website uh, because there are some fraudulent things out there. But this is the secure website.gov. Make sure it has the .gov at the end. Uh, that's really important. Hawaii is on the line to receive a lot of money from the federal government, but only if we are counted also for representation and when it comes to Congress. Uh, so make sure that you go ahead and fill that out. It takes 10 minutes. It is safe and secure, and it is so important. That's right. Very important to do. Uh, again, we want to remind you looking ahead that tomorrow uh, we will have Scott Murakami here to take uh, on your unemployment questions. We have a lot of questions that have already come in that we've already compiled. If you had missed our conversation with, uh, you know, with the director last week, we encourage you to head over to our website, scroll back through here through the Honolulu Star Advertiser page, or head over to coronavirushawaii.com where you can see some of the questions that he addressed last time. But we're going to be great to hear and get an update because that office seems to be changing every day with the amount of things that they're dealing with. Uh, and then we'll have Representative uh, Congressman Ed Case on Wednesday, followed by Superintendent Christina Kishimoto back here on Thursday to talk more about public schools. So another full week ahead of us and uh, looking forward to seeing all of you back here at 1030 on the Honolulu Star Advertiser platforms. Thank you so much for being here. Stay safe, social distance, wear a mask, do all the things so we can continue to see success here in the islands. Until tomorrow, we wish you a fond aloha. Aloha.